today. Uh, this is the developer and the DOM, a history of manipulation and abstraction. Um, my name is Greg Nowak, and this is uh, Zach Michael. Uh, we both really like JavaScript, and we have 10 plus years, each of us, uh, in des design and development. Zach is a JavaScript engineer, and I'm a senior front end developer. Uh, we work right here in Portland at a place called Squishy Media. Uh, Squishy Media specializes in data-driven applications and websites. Um, <clears throat> so we're here to kind of give a brief uh, beginner slash inter intermediate overview mm -hmm. of the history of JavaScript. Uh, we're here to entertain and hopefully amaze you, but Falling short of that, maybe our slides will make you laugh a little bit. Uh, we plan to trace the trajectory of client-side JavaScript from the beginning until present day. Uh, with that said, neither of us is David Crockford. Um, <clears throat> he no, is a master yeah. lecturer. So this isn't going to be his lecture of uh, going from punch cards to client-side web. We'll start when JavaScript was actually in the internet. Yeah. So. Um, we plan to explain some of the problems uh, faced by developers and solutions to those. Um, and finally, we'll look at where JavaScript may be headed and a few current examples of uh, more current problems. Um, so where did it come from? Here's a bit of the boring kind of beginner stuff. Um, it uh, originated, uh, sorry. Uh, originally, it was developed by, as a server-side scripting language uh, by Brendan Eich in 1995. Supposedly, he developed it in a week, um, which kind of adds to its cred and criticisms. Um, it was developed under the name Mocha, and it shipped being called LiveScript, and was later changed to JavaScript, um, also known currently as ECMAScript. Uh, they attached the name Java to confuse and hopefully attract new developers that were uh, using the hot new language Java. Beginning in 96, standards were written. Netscape pushed it into the browser. And of course, Microsoft refused to play along. Um, and they developed a port of JavaScript, also known as JScript, um, which contributed to what is known as the browser wars, the first browser wars. There's been multiple. Uh, and this divide left um, both JavaScript and JScript neglected. And it wasn't until 1996 uh, Netscape announced that they wanted to submit it to ECMA International for um, uh, an industry standard. And subsequent work resulted in the standardized version known as ECMAScript. We're currently at ECMAScript 6, which got published uh, this year. Um, in June of 2015. So what is the DOM? Uh, it's definitely not DOM DeLuise. Um, we're talking about the document object model, um, also known as the DOM. This is an independent cross-platform and language convention representing and interacting with objects in HTML. Uh, with the DOM, JavaScript can access and change all elements in an HTML document. The history of the document object model is intertwined with these original browser wars. Um, and eventually, uh, the W3C <coughs> began working on standardizing the, the DOM. Uh, level 2 was published in 2000. And it introduced a git element by ID, which is still currently being used in vanilla JavaScript today. Uh, currently, we're at level three, and that came, in, came out in 2003. And uh, level four is currently being developed. So there's kind of a large uh, lapse between new versions of these. And to kind of sum it up in a, one line, the DOM is just kind of this model that things have to follow in order to operate inside a browser. Oh. So. JavaScript was intended to be a language that would be appealing to non-professional programmers. Uh, we kind of disagree. 
And it was designed to run in Netscape Navigator, and its success in the early browsers led to it becoming a standard scripting language, uh, which is why you can find it in every browser, uh, modern browser today. Within the last 10 years, um, people really started using it as a dynamic object-oriented programming language, um, which I'm going to pass over the mic to mm -hmm. Zach here, and he's going to explain some of the current problems and the solutions, mm -hmm. too. And so to give a little context to this speech, we wanted to first introduce you to some of the basic history of JavaScript. And now I'll kind of walk through some of the problems that force JavaScript to evolve in certain ways. And so the first problem that anybody who's worked with the browser knows about is <laughs> browsers are horribly inconsistent, or at least they used to be horribly inconsistent. Um, there's pretty much from day one been an agreed upon standard of what a browser should do but they never actually do that. Uh, there's always bugs, gaps in uh, functionality, or uh, companies want to push a certain feature because they need it. So one browser will have this advanced functionality that none of the other ones will get. Um, and historically, browsers were horrible at this. But today, they're getting kind of a little bit better. But this is still an issue we face today. And some of the original pain points were uh, selector searching. So like, how do I find a certain thing in the DOM? Because I want to interact with it. And DOM traversal. So once you have a specific div or input, how do you get from that to another uh, div or uh, element to interact with? <coughs> and then how do you actually change what's on the page? How do you manipulate the DOM uh, dynamically? And I don't know, has anybody in here worked with XHR before the days of jQuery, when I uh, haven't been a developer quite that long, but I've heard it was just this traumatic experience that people talk about like a war story. <laughs> um, so what do we do to solve these problems? Originally, uh, you know, we, we developed libraries like jQuery or MooTools or Prototype that seek to kind of polyfill all the differences in the browser. So you can learn the jQuery API or the MooTools API. And that'll interact with all the browser APIs. So you don't have to learn them independently and work through all their quirks. And it's a little less uh, alchemy at that point. So I wanted to show you guys a little bit of a snippet of how this actually works. This is. Uh, a get CSS function from the original release of jQuery. Uh, so if you can see, we take an element and a property, and we're trying to you know, get the contents of that property. And if the browser is able to read the style property of the element, we'll use that route. If it has current style, we'll try that route. Or if it has document.defaultview.getComputedStyle. style. We'll try to do that and then use some regex voodoo to actually get what we're looking for. And if all else fails, we'll just return you nothing. Um, so that's a, a little look at how that actually works in practice. And once we get to this point where you know we can reasonably manipulate things in the browser how we want to, and uh, you know have that work in the majority of browsers, we start developing more advanced functionality. And now we have this problem of application architecture. So how do we organize our applications? And uh, you know, I think any developer at some level can figure out better ways to organize applications. But you know, at some point, we shouldn't all be doing this independently uh, because you know, like as developers working in an agency, I want to make sure that he's able to read what I'm doing and kind of understand it at some level. And if a developer leaves and somebody has to take on that project, you want to make sure there's some kind of uh, idiom or conventions going on. And pretty much you want to make sure that, you know, you don't walk into a brownfield project and just rage quit because you can't understand what's going on at all. So. So here's a little snippet. Um, 
just some sort of pseudocode in jQuery looking at how you might build some uh, login, log out user interface interactions. And this might not look that bad, but all of a sudden you have to start thinking, how do I manage this when I literally have 500 times this much code? And you know, when I first started developing, everything went in a single file, and all of a sudden you have this giant mess that you have to read through to make anything happen. So we have to start thinking about these problems, like how do we break things out into separate files and bring them back together in a logical way? How do we make things discrete modules so we're not overwriting? functionality we've written previously, and how do we work with other developers without you know, trying to work in the same file at the same time. And I don't know about you guys, mm -hmm. but this looks pretty good. I've seen uh, projects where I've come in and it doesn't even look or remotely uh, become comprehensible. So mm -hmm. name conventions and stuff, mm -hmm. it's really difficult. And so one of the uh, you know, early solutions to this problem was early JavaScript client-side frameworks. And uh, some of these are XJS, YUI, Dojo. Um, I was not working enough in client-side JavaScript when these were out to know them in any detail, but the idea is that they, you know, provide some of these tools of idiomatic ways to use JavaScript. So. If I walk into a YUI project, at least I can read documentation about how YUI is structured and get an idea so I'm not just like reading through source code trying to understand what somebody else's thought process is because it's been formalized in a structure. And a lot of these kind of covered some of the same bases uh, as jQuery and those uh, you know, browser polyfilling tools but tried to take on some of the structure as well. And obviously there were many, many more uh, than I have here. So, you know, after we get to this point, um, things seem to be going pretty well, but you know, the web is this thing that has just grown crazily. So uh, as we build more complex websites, people use websites more, people funnel more money into the internet, and we now have to build more and more and more and more complicated websites. So we're using Ajax everywhere, we're using complex interactions, and we're starting to see mobile devices. And those create a totally new experience that we have to account for. And so the next problem we want to kind of look at is the mobile web. So we've talked through uh, you know, all these browser inconsistencies, uh, problems with working with other developers, problems with organizing applications. We're feeling kind of comfortable, and now all of a sudden we have to do this with tiny screens, spotty networks, and weak hardware. And so all of a sudden, you know, we start hearing everybody talk about responsive web design, and um, we have to think about considerations like if somebody has their, uh, this web application open and their network just completely dies, like in a traditional website, that next request just gives you nothing back. But is there something meaningful we can give a user in a, in a state where we have no network connection? And how do we fix all th these problems without adding too much processing or mem memory overhead? So. Some of the solutions we saw to these problems were, you know, responsiveness, as I've talked about, trying to make things that kind of stretch and morph uh, to fit various screen profiles. Uh, we also started delving into device detection. So that kind of helps responsiveness if we can know ahead of time that this is a phone or a browser or a specific browser or phone. And then we started working uh, things into single page application architecture. And I think this is something that has totally developed because of the mobile landscape, because this architecture pattern makes so much more sense on a phone all of a sudden. And to give just a little overview of what I mean by single page applications is in a you know, traditional web uh, architecture scheme, the browser makes requests to a server the server returns a page to that browser, and then as soon as something new needs to happen, the browser requests a new page, and it dumps that old page and gets a new page. So with single page applications, uh, the browser makes a single request to a server to get a page, and then from there on, 
it can just interact with web services to get data to modify that page in various ways. And some of the benefits of doing this are this web service traffic is a lot less intensive. So if we've got a crappy network, you know, we can kind of handle that a little bit better. And if the network dies, you can still have this page and it can still have interactions and we can tell the user that we're sorry this isn't working right now because your network just dropped. And yeah, so after dealing with the mobile web a little bit, you know, again, we just have this constant increase of complexity. And so now on top of doing all the regular things we wanted to do in the browser of, you know, having forms that interact nicely, all of a sudden we have to make architectural considerations for things like single page applications, which now means we have tons of logic on the client side or operating in the browser. Uh, we're now doing routing, so we're now figuring out how to make it look and feel like you're having this paged environment while you only have one page. And we're doing templating because we're bringing dynamic data into the browser and changing what you're actually seeing. And so while we're bringing all this complex logic in, we still have this desire as people who need to work to focus on business logic because Clients don't generally pay you to figure out weird, complex routing uh, problems. They want to pay you to make their product work like they want it to. And so this is a solution we've seen in more recent years, which have been this kind of second generation of uh, client-side web frameworks. Backbone was probably the first one of this generation to get any kind of real traction and popularity, and it's still has a very large community base today. Uh, Angular, I believe, was technically the first of this generation, but it was initially licensed as a commercial product and nobody really adopted it as such. So it kind of sat and wasted until it got brought into Google and open sourced. And then we have Ember and Knockout, which you know are similar frameworks. So what did these frameworks add? They solved a lot of these problems of client-side routing so we don't have to write a routing framework. They set up data binding so we can focus more on you know, manipulating data in a kind of business logic oriented way than uh, searching through the DOM constantly to delete divs and update divs and change text. Uh, they gave us module systems to overcome a lot of the problems of you know, overwriting namespaces and keeping files separate. And they, you know, one of the biggest ads, in my opinion, is they gave us style guides and best practices so a lot of developers can work on one project. And if they don't know what a controller might look like, um, you know, they have something to look at to say, hey, this is the best practice to write this type of functionality. So everybody can kind of read it in a consistent, idiomatic way. And one interesting technical thing that kind of got added uh, with these frameworks, uh, Angular in particular had this concept of a diffing algorithm. Some of the other ones did as well. And this is what allows us to focus a little bit more on business logic than on DOM manipulation. So all of a sudden, we just link things in the DOM and the data model, and instead of, you know, uh, manually changing the DOM however we want it. This just checks and says, hey, did something change in the DOM? And if so, we'll change it in our data model. And if something changes in our data mo model, we'll change it in the DOM as well. And beyond making it a little bit easier to write applications, this also made it a little bit easier to optimize DOM manipulation because now this DOM manipulation or you know changing elements on the page is happening through this separate programmatic part that somebody can optimize separately and they don't have to think about uh, you know, the client's desires and business logic while they're doing that. And so even with all of this, we still have problems with performance and scalability. Um, you know, these recent frameworks 
were built on kind of server side paradigms, so they don't always make sense in the client side context. Uh, so things like MVC might have made a lot of sense on the server, but in the client they might be a little bit over, over complicated or some of the more granular functionality of like just making uh, form interactions nice might not really need to be separated into a model and a view. And they all still relied on a relative uh, direct manipulation of the DOM and this has huge performance implications because anytime we're doing something with the DOM, it's a pretty expensive request uh, in terms of performance and speed. And so the solution to these problems are we'll just pile more frameworks on top of it because everybody loves learning JavaScript frameworks. <laughs> and so in this a more recent wave, we see Angular 2.0, uh, React, Riot, JS blocks, and pretty much every week or two you can find something else. Um, but in spite of, you know, I hear a lot of dread often about how there's just constantly hot new things in client-side JavaScript and it's just flavor of the week tools, but there are kind of cool inter interesting innovations coming out of these various waves of framework evolution. And one of the most interesting ones recently has been the idea of a virtual DOM. So we still have this kind of diffing algorithm, data model, DOM set up, but now we have this new layer of virtual DOM. And this becomes really interesting because now you can super optimize how you're manipulating the DOM because you can do it in big chunks. You can first change things in the virtual DOM, which then, uh, you know, optimally changes things in the DOM. And you can also start thinking about this virtual DOM as something entirely different than the DOM. It doesn't have to render into a web page, and it doesn't have to be rendered in the browser. So some of the possibilities of this are, you know, we can start rendering this virtual DOM on any platform server side, so in Node or in the browser or Scala or whatever language you like to work in. And we can also start converting this virtual DOM to any view layer because it's just an abstraction of how views are represented. So you could, at least in theory, some of this has already been done, write a converter to convert virtual DOM to you know, HTML in the browser or the iOS view framework, or you can write a converter that converts the same DOM to Android. And uh, you know, this is kind of approaching this idea that everybody dreams of, of write once and run it everywhere. It's still not there yet and probably never will be perfect, but I think this is a much more interesting solution to tackle how to run something on different platforms than to just wrap it in a browser, which is what PhoneGap and Cordova and all those frameworks do. And another thing that this wave of frameworks brought was uh, language enhancements, so uh, native to these frameworks, uh, we can use things like ECMAScript 6 and TypeScript, so people who have, you know, kind of thought JavaScript was the bane of their existence can now use strong typed features and actually object-oriented programming tools to make things a lot nicer. And another one of the most interesting uh, kind of evolutions in architecture of this most recent wave of frameworks has been uh, componentized architecture. So components are kind of this neat way to encapsulate functionality and uh, build views like nesting dolls and they kind of allow you to think at a certain level of uh, abstraction at, at one time. So uh, an example here. So here's an example, I have, it's just a simple input field and I really like this pattern where uh, as the user types their placeholder, oh, I guess I should type on the right screen and not in my speaker notes. So as a user types, uh, the placeholder just gets replaced by a label hiding up there and as you delete it, you know, we get back to placeholder. This is relatively simple functionality to build and requires not a ton of HTML elements. Here's, oh. 
Here's literally the code from that example. Um, and although this isn't all that difficult, I don't want to have to write this HTML every time I want to do this interaction. I just want to focus on my form at some level. So when I want to change this interaction, I can think about this component and uh, updating its functionality. But when I want to write a form, I can think about writing it in this componentized way you can see down here. So this is kind of a before and after. So I think that's an amazing, super beneficial thing uh, to do to prevent too, much, uh, comp too many complications. And that's kind of where we are at today. And I kind of wanted to briefly go over a few problems that in spite of all this, we still face today. Uh, yeah, that's always a problem. I guess it might be a matter of perspective, though. So one thing that's always problematic is web and mobile technologies have this immense amount of crossover, yet are just, just utterly different systems. Like the web's built in JavaScript and HTML, and iOS is built in Objective-C, and now Swift, and Android's built in Java. But there's so many use cases where we just want them to do the exact same thing, and we're not wanting to build disparate things. but like, why are our tools so, so different? Uh, networks and small devices still suffer from bandwidth and performance limitations. So we still have this problem of, you know, my mobile network can't actually ha handle enough traffic to do complicated media interactions or people uh, run out of memory. And, you know, this gets better when people have flagship devices, but in the real world, not everybody has really, really sweet tablets and cool devices. Also, uh, you know, recent years, privacy and security has become such an issue publicly, and everybody's very concerned about it. But uh, we just went over all these tools that allow us to put crazy amounts of business logic and code in the client side in this place in the browser that's just inherently not secure. It's not safe. So, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, and people will kind of uh, shoot themselves in the foot by putting things that shouldn't ever happen in the browser in the browser because now they can. So I think uh, now is the time we also have to be very security-minded while we're building in the browser where we might not have had to be uh, previously. And uh, something we are definitely very familiar with working in the agency world is there's still requirements for legacy browsers. Like, hey, we want you to build this really complicated, beautiful application, but it needs to run in IE7 because the system administrators at our office don't want to upgrade anything. Ever. And for some reason, this just never changes. And then. Uh, the JavaScript community has just this insane churn rate. So although we're developing cool new toys to play with and make our lives a lot easier, all of a sudden we have to like learn each new tool in 10 hours to keep up with all of them. Uh, so that's pretty much the scope of our talk. Uh, we're very much open to any questions.